Hello, welcome to Let's Get Down to Business with the Prince Rupert and District Chamber of Commerce. We are here to give a voice to our local business owners, entrepreneurs, and community leaders to strengthen and support our local business community and to share the wisdom and experience of longtime business leaders and the fresh ideas and experiences of new entrepreneurs. So let's get down to business. Hi, my name is Daphne Thompson and I'm the president of the Prince Rupert and District Chamber of Commerce. Today I have the utmost pleasure to have Taylor Backrack, Member of Parliament on Let's Get Down to Business. Taylor, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks so much for having me, Daphne. This is, uh, this is really exciting. I must admit, it really is. I'm excited to hear everything that you've got to say. So, but first, let's start off with how did you get to where you are? Yeah, so I, I've served as Member of Parliament here in Skeena Buckley Valley for three years now. And before that, I spent eight years as the Mayor of Smithers working in local government. I, I've actually worked in local government since 2008 when I was elected uh, to the village council in the in the village of Telqua, which is a small community just outside Smithers. So uh, I've got lots of experience um, in government here in the Northwest. And for the past three years, I've had the honor of representing communities all the way from Fraser Lake and Fort St. James uh, up to the Yukon border, including the whole coast, Haida Gwaii, Prince Rupert, Kitimat, Smithers Terrace, all of those wonderful communities. And uh, of course, all the way up Highway 37 to Stewart and Iskut and Telegraph Creek and Atlin, way up in the far Northwest corner. Wow, that's quite a large territory. How do you handle that? Or do you find that maybe in the north that most and most businesses have got similar issues? Well, I, I think businesses in every community have different challenges and opportunities. Uh, but as a, as a region, we have some similar uh, challenges, I would say, uh, particularly around remoteness and transportation. Um, and then, of course, I think we're going to talk today about uh, the labor market and recruiting and retaining employees. These are our challenges that are being experienced right across Canada. So some things are unique to the Northwest and unique to remoter parts of, of our country. And, and some things are, um, are shared with communities of all sizes across Canada. So what was the driving force be behind you getting into Parliament? Yeah, well, like I said, I spent eight years working as the mayor of Smithers and representing my home community. And what I realized is that a lot of the challenges that municipalities and local governments face really can't be addressed at the local level. They can't be addressed without the partnership of other orders of government, without the provincial government and the federal government, um, that really we need to ensure that we have a strong voice for the Northwest if our communities are going to thrive. And so there was an opportunity for me to take my experience in local government and my experience living here in the Northwest and apply that at the federal level to work to give a voice to all of our communities here in, in Northwest BC in the House of Commons. And, uh, and so that's been a tremendous honor for the past three years. It's something I'm always learning more about and always striving to do a better job of um, representing people from, from all corners of our region. And uh, yeah, it can, be, it can be an interesting challenge because of course there are lots of different perspectives, right? Our communities are all slightly different from each other and the needs of different parts of the region are different. And so what I'm always looking for are the common values and the common threads that pull us together as a region. The, the things that we share in common, I think that's where our real strength lies and, and trying to um, package that up and communicate it to the people who are making decisions for the federal government. And what are some of the, the best opportunities that you've identified for businesses specifically in the North? Best opportunities for businesses in the North. Well, you know, we're talking today about Prince Rupert uh, mm. specifically, and, and Prince Rupert is in a really exciting and interesting place in its history. Um, as you know, the community's gone through some challenging times in, in past decades uh, with the, the um, decline of some of the traditional industries, the loss of the pulp mill, the decline of the fishing industry. Um, there was at least a decade there that was, was pretty bleak for the community. And in the past decade, we've seen a real resurgence, especially with the uh, development and expansion of the port 
which has really transformed the com community and created a huge amount of opportunity. Uh, that comes with some challenges too, but right now I, I think Prince Rupert is in, in a, a good place when it comes to the future because um, as a Pacific gateway, there is such tremendous growth and opportunity on the horizon. And the, the challenge at, at this juncture is making smart decisions to position local businesses and to position the city of Prince Rupert to take advantage of that, that opportunity. Um, and I, you know, we could talk about a whole bunch of different aspects of that, but I think the biggest thing is uh, making sure that we're finding ways to support municipal infrastructure so that as the port grows, the city is able to uh, maintain and enhance those services that are so vital to the people who work at the port. Mm. That the port and the city aren't these two separate things. They're very much reliant on each other. And we need to make sure, um, particularly when it comes to infrastructure, and I, this is, we're recording this in a week when there's a local state of emergency in Prince Rupert because yeah. of the situation facing the drinking water infrastructure, the, the water pipes and water mains. Uh, with six water main failures just in the past number of days. So there's a huge need for investment in the city so that the city can support the growth of the port. And that's one of the big things I'm going to be taking on over this next year, working in partnership uh, with the mayor and council, working in partnership with local residents to make sure the federal government understands that situation and putting pressure on them to make the changes and make the investments that are needed to ensure that uh, the community is able to support what is um, going to be a, a huge influx of new residents and, and new uh, workers that are gonna be taking advantage of these opportunities. So uh, it's a unique challenge in Prince Rupert. I think there are some other communities that are seeing rapid uh, industrial growth like that, uh, Kitimat being the other one. And so uh, I see my job as seeking to understand um, the nuance of, of what those challenges are, and then connecting local leaders with federal leaders and making sure that when the federal government is making decisions, they understand the imperative for, um, for those investments in community. One of the big challenges or one of the big things happening right now in Ottawa is the uh, transport minister has just tabled new legislation um, that is going to amend the Marine Act, which is the, the main federal legislation that governs supports. And so I'm going to be working not only with uh, the city, but also with the port to uh, understand what these changes mean locally and whether there are amendments that need to be made to reflect the local situation. So it's an exciting time, lots of, lots of challenges. I know we want to talk about small businesses in Prince Rupert as well and, and some of the, uh, the things that they're facing. I'm happy to uh, chat a bit about that too. But overall, I would say Prince Rupert is in a really unique place right now. And um, I think the next number of years look, uh, look pretty uh, good in terms of um, growth and expansion with some key challenges around maintaining infrastructure. That would be the big one. All right. Um, yeah, so we, we mentioned also recruitment and retention. Mm -hmm. That is something that everyone faces here. And then the next step would be housing. So if we do get the guys, where do we put them? Uh, what uh, I know that you are definitely busy finding solutions for this, um, but for the guy on the ground, like the the real small businesses, how can that? How what are some of the big solutions that you could render to the smaller guys? So we're talking about recruitment and retention of employees, and yes. this is probably the biggest challenge that businesses across the Northwest face right now. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter the size of business, whether it's a mom and pop shop with two or three employees or a, a larger business with 50 or 100 employees, everyone is struggling to fill positions right now. And that's connected to a couple of things. I think the biggest driver of that is just the demographic trend that we're seeing with more people retiring. Um, you know, a lot of the baby boomers are leaving the workforce and there aren't enough people to fill those roles. And so uh, we've known this is coming for a long time and now it's here and businesses are really, really struggling with it. Uh, in terms of how we address it in, in general terms, broad strokes, there are two key ways. So one is uh, ensuring that people in parts of the community that are underrepresented in the workforce 
So, um, you know, there are people who, if they had support, if they had certain barriers removed, could access those jobs. We need to work as governments to make sure that we're helping those people uh, get into the workforce if they're currently not employed. Um, so that's one, one way that we can uh, ensure that those positions are getting filled. The other way, obviously, is by bringing more people into the country to fill those roles. And right now, a lot of small businesses in Prince Rupert uh, access the Temporary Foreign Workers Program. Uh, this has yes. been a, pr a program that people have found beneficial. Um, our view is that that program, we, we need to move away from uh, bringing in temporary workers to ensure that these people who are coming here to work are, also have a path to citizenship, that we're, we're bringing in people, if, the, if, they're, if they want to contribute to our country in terms of employment, um, we should also provide them with a, a track to citizenship. And right now there are thousands of people in Canada that are filling key roles in our economy um, that should be made uh, permanent residents of this country because they're contributing in such important ways. So the federal government has made a new commitment to uh, bring in 500,000 um, immigrants to Canada in next year, 500,000 uh, per year moving forward. Uh, this is a huge increase. My, my recollection is right now we bring in around 300,000. Um, and so obviously one of the driving factors behind that is the need for more people in the workforce. Um, but it also comes with the challenge of how we provide housing and other services for these, these folks that we're bringing in. Not just that. <clears throat> so I, I totally, I am a product of the foreign temporary um, foreign temporary work permits and things. So mm -hmm. I am totally for that. Um, the issue that I'm seeing is it takes six to eight months for these candidates to come through. So what do you do in that period of time? This is an immediate need. Is there a way that we can shorten that time period to 60 days? Because that's manageable. Um, anything more than that is, well, it, uh, I could get an apprentice in or anything else like that. So that's the one point. The other point is also a lot of the jobs specifically in Prince Rupert are mostly unskilled. So there is, it's uh, roughly what, 19 to 25 bucks an hour type mm -hmm. of jobs that we just struggle to fill. Yeah. For the uh, immigrant, that is not a role that they generally can fill because these immigrants are skilled workers. They start off with 30 to 30. Basically, I think the new um, uh, budget is that the employer has to be able to pay them, I think, $36 an hour or something. I do speak under correction. But so what I'm trying to say is that is a, a definite solution. And I completely agree with you. Practically, for the small businesses, that isn't a solution. They can't pay that higher fee and they need the people right away. What is something that you can address in that way? Well, the issue of timelines is a real issue. And unfortunately, what we're seeing is a, is a huge backlog um, in IRCC, the, the federal department that manages all of these different immigration programs. Uh, part of that is a result of the pandemic and a backlog that accumulated because um, you know some personnel were pulled onto other files. And, um, and that's something that needs to be addressed. So we need the federal government to uh, invest more resources in the processing of these applications so that we can get those timelines down uh, and businesses are going to be able to access the people that they need in a, in a reasonable amount of time. Because I agree that, you know, six months might be reasonable. Beyond that, it's, it's such a long process that businesses are having to uh, plan so far ahead and often there are gaps between, um, you know, when they need the employees and when they eventually arrive. So well, one thing that my office does, Daphne. Sorry, just one a, thing, if I can yeah. address that specifically, is six months is already a very, very long period of time where um, a job has just been granted to a trade company. They need that guys mm -hmm. now. They can't tell the yeah. client, hey, I can only start in six months when my guys arrive in the country. Yeah, for sure. And I think this also points to the fact that the temporary foreign worker model is inherently... Um, a bit of a, a stopgap measure. Like this is not, um, it's not the model that we want to see in place forever. We want to 
ensure that people coming to the country are able to gain residency and and do that in a timely manner and that people who come here to work and want to become permanent residents of the country have a way to do that in a, in a really timely way. Mm -hmm. So, um, and at the same time that we have other streams of, um, of recruitment from populations that aren't well represented in the, in the workforce currently. So that's another, another aspect of that. When I was gonna say one thing that my office can offer is that we can advocate on behalf of employers uh, you know, if they have applications in for temporary foreign workers that have been sitting in the queue for a long time and they feel like the federal government isn't giving them the attention they deserve, um, we can certainly make inquiries on their behalf and ensure that, uh, you know, they're, they're getting uh, processed in a, in a reasonable time. Um, we're also advocating for more resources to be uh, applied to processing applications. Um, right across the immigration system. This is, doesn't just affect temporary foreign workers, but right across the board. Uh, and encouraging the government to regularize those folks who are already in the country as temporary foreign workers, to give them that path to citizenship and, and permanent residency. So, um, you know, immig immigrants really uh, uh, built a lot of our country. A lot of it was built on immigration. It's such an important part of um, our future, and we need to make sure that we have an efficient process uh, that um, gives people those opportunities and, and doesn't leave them in a queue for months and months and months when they could be, uh, you know, finding homes in our community and, and finding roles in our, in our local economy. So it's the, it's the number one challenge. I wish I had a, a magic wand, Daphne, or some sort of like uh, solution that no one had thought of. It's just a really tough situation right now. I know the provincial government and the federal government are, are working hard to, to fill those roles. Uh, Nathan Cullen, who used to be the member of parliament, is um, uh, formerly served as the provincial minister responsible for immigration. I know he worked really hard on that file. Um, that file's now been transferred over to a different minister. Uh, but the role that my, my office can play, because I'm not part of the government, I'm, I'm in an opposition party, uh, is helping the federal government understand the needs of lo local employers, uh, help them understand how serious the situation is, and pushing them to make the changes to policy, to make the changes to legislation that are needed to improve the situation. So if, if local businesses have ideas, and we've certainly advocated on behalf of local businesses a lot in the past, if they have ideas about how the system could be done better, then I'm happy to pass those along to the minister in charge and hopefully um, we'll see some change down the road, but uh, this is going to be, it's going to be a problem we're going to be working on for a lot of years yet, because this is a, a huge demographic change, and yeah. there just aren't enough people in Canada coming into the workforce from our population to fill all of the job openings that are going to be created. So um, yeah, we're going to have to be really creative, and it, it speaks to a bunch of the other aspects. You know, we, we often talk about business as a separate thing, but it's so connected to the rest of the community, right? And I think people are more and more seeing this when it comes to things like housing, because if there's nowhere for people to live, then how do you recruit new people to fill job openings? Uh, this is a challenge in Prince Rupert, it's a challenge in, in every community in the Northwest. So we need to be investing in housing. Um, you can't build new housing if your municipal infrastructure is crumbling. So we need yeah. to be investing in municipal infrastructure, right? Uh, all of these things are all connected together. And it's like a, it's like an old sweater, right? You, you, you find a little loose thread and you start pulling on that thread and you find pretty soon Another that it's one. connected to the whole, the whole sweater. Um, we need to be working on all of these fronts harder than ever because uh, a lot depends on it. Yeah. Um... But again, even though there is there are all of these challenges, this does give opportunity. This gives pl a platform for great opportunity. Um, what are some of the, if all of this have not magically, we were able to, to take a wand and make it all go right. What are, what for you, what would be the, the biggest opportunity that you can identify? What's the biggest opportunity? If we could make a magic wand, what would the biggest opportunity look like? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's such a good question. Um, oh, I, I was just gonna say, Daphne, on your previous point about opportunities, 
you know, looking back 10 years, uh, 10 years ago in the Northwest, the conversation was about creating more jobs, you know, the need to create more jobs. And it's, in, it's interesting. We have a kind of a short memory, I think, because that's not the conversation today. The conversation today is how do we find more employees? How do we bring more people to our community to fill these jobs that exist? How do we build housing for them to live in? Um, and so the conversation changes over time. It's, it's an interesting one. Uh, what would my dream be if I had a magic wand and, and could, uh, could wave the magic wand? I think, you know, there's a lot of disparity in our communities still today. And there are a lot of people um, who aren't able to access the opportunities that they should be able to because of dif different barriers. So my dream would be that at a time when we have so many job openings and so much opportunity, that all of the people who currently live in the Northwest and who are struggling with different barriers, whether it's poverty, whether it's literacy, whether it's transportation, um, could have those barriers lifted and could find ways to support their families and, and live really um, healthy, vibrant lives here in the Northwest. Mm. Uh, starting from that place of, of community well-being and, and saying, you know, as much as we want to grow, there are people in our community right now who aren't able to access opportunities. And I think that's, that's where a lot of our focus is as a political party right now is looking at um, things like universal dental care, uh, things like strengthening our healthcare system, things like building affordable housing so that, you know, uh, families who aren't able to meet their needs are able to get to that place where they're able to take part fully as uh, members of our community. Mm -hmm. And I think that helps everybody. It, it helps them. It helps uh, their neighbors. It helps local businesses. If, if people are able to thrive, if people are able to meet their needs, and if people are healthy, then we do better all across our society. So thinking of it holistically, I think if I had a magic wand, that's the, the magic wand that I'd wave. And, um, and it's a huge challenge, right? If we think about uh, people living with disabilities and mm. the challenges they face, um, there are a lot of people who still aren't able to access affordable childcare. Uh, they can't participate in the economy if they can't uh, afford childcare. Um, so many, so many different barriers out there. And uh, there's a lot of work being done, but there's sure a lot left to do. Mm. Speaking about healthcare, um, is there uh, or any of the programs that you are involved with incentivizing um, the increase in population from the people that are already here? So, so maybe reframe that. Like, I'm not quite sure I understand what you're getting at. Is there... Is it incentivized for the people that are contributing to the economy to have more babies? <laughs> well, that's an interesting one. It, it's, not, it's not something that's really talked about, uh, incentivizing population growth. Uh, I know that different parts of the world have tried it, mm -hmm. and I believe in Quebec, actually. They had a policy at one time um, where they were incentivizing young parents to have more kids. Uh, it's not something that I've ever heard uh, as part of the conversation here in the Northwest. Well, that would definitely, not immediate, but that would secure a proper growth, specifically for those that are contributing to the economy. Um, Japan, I know, has got that running. Um, there's big incentives for trying to... Yeah, I, I think it would be a controversial one. And, you know, of course... Mm -hmm. Uh, family planning and family size, it's a very personal decision for people. And so I think for the government to get involved in that, it's, uh, it would be, it would be controversial for sure. And, and like, like I said, making history, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, if it's something the chamber wants to put forward as a proposal, <laughs> I'd be happy to chat I about think, it. I think uh, that might fall out of our mandate, but um, <laughs> that is definitely, that would be um, other, other countries have done that um i don't know what the success rate is but it would definitely uh specific specifically for families that are immigrating the majority of them are not just seeking a better a life for them but also a better life for their kids so if there is incentivized for hey establish your family here grow your family that might be a different idea yeah, well, and through our immigration program, there are certainly family reunification uh, mm -hmm. programs that allow people to 
uh, bring their family members over. And, and our office certainly does a lot of advocacy for that to take place. Um, the other thing that we haven't talked about, Daphne, is, is the recognition of foreign credentials. And that's somewhere where we need to do a lot of work, particularly when it comes to our healthcare system. But I would say right across the spectrum, whether it's in uh, transportation. I, I, I'm the transport critic for the NDP. And uh, on the transport committee in Ottawa, we've been talking about labor shortages in the transport sector. Um, talking about in, in shipping, for instance, right? And hearing from the Ferry Association about the need for uh, skilled employees to work on board ships. Um, there are people coming in from other countries that have credentials, and we need a process to, um, in a really timely way, recognize those credentials and allow them to fill those positions. Uh, at the same time, we need to ensure the safety and integrity of our, of our system. But there's a sweet spot there where I, I'm not sure that we found that spot. And so there's a lot of work taking place on how to um, speed up that process and make sure through different agreements that people who are certified to operate a ship in another country, according to international standards, are able to access those roles um, here in Canada as well. Well, and that should also be a very cost-effective way, because what majority is, is there are ways for that to be credited, but it's usually mm -hmm. extremely expensive. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And when it comes to healthcare, we're at a critical point right now. And you know, if you look at many aspects of our healthcare system, you see that there it, it's it's struggling to mm. meet the demands that are placed on it, and um, especially around staffing shortages, the shortage of health professionals, um, nurses, family doctors, all of these things. And so, to the degree that there are people um, with credentials in other countries that are able to meet the standard here in Canada, we need to make sure that they're able to access those opportunities. Yeah. So just before we end off, Taylor, what is one thing that you can say to truly inspire our business community? To inspire the business community. Oh, wow. That's, uh, well, I, I think my reflection um, traveling around uh, through communities in the Northwest is that we're blessed in this region with such incredible entrepreneurship. Um, people who get into small business uh, have amazing ideas, they have an amazing work ethic, and they bring a lot of creativity uh, to their roles. And so I think, you know, we often think of business simply as a way for people to earn uh, a living, uh, but it's so much more than that. They contribute to the fabric of the community in many, many different ways. And so I, I, I would end this interview just with an expression of gratitude for uh, the folks who are, are doing that, who are working so hard, who are making big sacrifices in order to get their businesses off the ground. Um, I had a small business. I know that it takes a lot of energy and a lot of dedication to, um, you know, to make your clients and your customers happy and to um, make sure that you're meeting your own financial needs. And, uh, you know, to the degree that we're able to provide them uh, support, I think we really need to pull together and make sure that small local business especially is supported, uh, not just through things like government grants and programs, but by the community. Because in many ways, they're up against some real challenges. We, we live in a global economy, um, e-commerce and uh, Amazon, these huge multinational companies are um, making it ever harder for uh, small businesses, especially in the retail sector to survive. So yeah. as, as residents of the Northwest, we need to um, come together and, and say, you know what, we can't afford to lose these small businesses from our community. And the way that we can keep them is by making it a priority with our dollars, with our spending choices to support local businesses. Um, because it, we, I, I would challenge someone to imagine our communities without uh, the diversity of small business that we see today. And yeah. um, we, we, in some ways, you don't know what you've got until it's gone. And we can't afford to learn that lesson by losing these businesses. So especially this time of year, we're talking during the holidays when, you know, a lot of people are, are out there uh, spending money. Let's make sure that we're walking down the street to the small businesses in our community and uh, looking for ways to offer them support. And um, yeah, that would be, that would be the last 
My last word is just one of gratitude for all the entrepreneurs out there and to say that my office is there to support you. So if there are needs that you see, if you're struggling with something, uh, come in and talk to my team. We can advocate for you. We can connect you to programs that already exist. And if there are things that the federal government needs to hear, I'm happy to deliver those messages with as strong a voice as I possibly can. And how do we get a hold of you if there is something that we would like to advocate or that we we'd like to bring to your attention? For sure. So I have uh, an office in Prince Rupert, a community office in Prince Rupert, and my door there is always open. Uh, you can find us in the Ocean Center. Um, easy to find. And uh, you can also contact me by phone, by email, on social media, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all of those ways. So I want to be as accessible as I can. I spend a lot of time in Prince Rupert. So if people want to meet face to face, I'm always happy to schedule a time. And um, yeah, let's work together. I think we, there's a huge amount of opportunity right now. And the more that we can uh, take the time to understand what the challenges are and then work together for the change we need, uh, the better. Well, well, thank you so much, Taylor. It was great having you on Let's Get Down to Business. Thanks, Daphne. Really appreciate the time. And thanks for all the work that you do. You're very welcome. Okay. And that's, you, that's, that's it for today. Thank you so much for listening. Remember, if you'd like to be a guest on Let's Get Down to Business, make sure to reach out. We'd love to get to know you better. See you next time. Thank you for listening to the Let's Get Down to Business with the Prince Rupert and District Chamber of Commerce. If you would like to be featured as a guest on a future episode, please email us at rupertchamber at gmail.com or direct message us on Facebook or Instagram at Prince Rupert Chamber.